This is the story of how Harvard professor David Sinclair got away with $720 million and is using the same strategy to do it again today. There have been some recent developments in this saga, which is why I'm doing this video now, and I'll let you know about those developments at the end of the video. The story begins in 1999, where lab partner of David Sinclair, Matt Cableline, showed that if you overactivate an enzyme called SIR2 in yeast, you can cause a 30% extension in lifespan. David Sinclair then published three studies in quick succession. The first claimed that resveratrol, a compound found in red wine, activates the sirtuin one enzyme in worms. The second study claimed that by using resveratrol to activate the sirtuin one enzyme, you can extend the lifespan of both worms and flies. Then in a separate study claimed that resveratrol extends mice lifespan as well. So by 2006, the hype around resveratrol was reaching boiling point, and David Sinclair formed a company called Searchless Pharmaceuticals with a proprietary blend of micronized resveratrol to help with absorption. That's an important point for later in the video, because he's using the exact same strategy with a different molecule, where he created a proprietary blend. And as an aside, the resveratrol that supplement companies sell today is also micronized to help with absorption. All of this captured the attention of the pharmaceutical giant, GSK, and they purchased Searchers Pharmaceuticals for the eye-watering sum of $720 million in 2008. David Sinclair also became a tenure professor at Harvard, but after the purchase, things started to quickly unravel for GSK, and the genius of David Sinclair became evident. GSK spent the next five years and millions more trying to replicate Sinclair's results, but to no avail, and eventually the searcher's division was shut down. Naturally, GSK wanted to get their $720 million back, but to do that, they had to prove that Sinclair intentionally tricked them. But here's the genius. Sinclair protected himself in three ways so GSK could never get their money back. Starting with the idea that overactivating the sirtuin one enzyme leads to lifespan extension. While Matt Cableline's experiments in yeast have been replicated by other labs, Sinclair's 2004 lifespan extension research on activating sirtuin one in worms and flies has not. Instead, when Sinclair's claims were re-examined by another lab in 2011, they found that when you do the experiments properly and you standardize the genetic background, as well as using appropriate controls, there was no lifespan extension effect for worms and flies if you activate the sirtuin one enzyme. So by not performing the initial experiments correctly and making amateur mistakes, Sinclair created plausible deniability for himself. Remember, for GSK to get their money back, they had to prove that Sinclair intentionally tricked them, so this was the first of three walls of incompetence that Sinclair constructed to protect himself. And just to finish the Satuan enzyme part, here is Professor Matt Cableline discussing the Satuan research on Dr. Peter Atia's podcast. You know, people who are in the field, I think, sometimes think of me as this anti sirtuin guy, which is absolutely not the truth. I'm the guy, I'm the guy who first showed that you could overexpress a sirtuin and increase lifespan. If anybody's going to be pro sirtuin, it's me. I think the problem is that I've seen a lot of data that has that people have struggled to reproduce, right? And and I and I just honestly don't know how to interpret that. The second claim that Sinclair made was that resveratrol directly activates the sirtuin one enzyme. And GSK almost got their $720 million back on this one. Let me explain. In 2005, so before GSK gave the $720 million to David Sinclair, the ex-lab partners of Sinclair, Professors Matt Cableine and Brian Kennedy, published a paper showing that it wasn't resveratrol that was activating the SIR2 gene, but a fluorescent dye mixed in with the resveratrol that was responsible for the erroneous findings. Essentially, for the second time, Sinclair's results were nothing more than a lab error. That shock finding was confirmed by two separate labs in 2009 and 2010, both confirming that Sinclair's results were again nothing more than a lab error. This almost caught Sinclair out, because the GSK deal closed in 2008, but Matt Cableline and Brian Kennedy showed in 2005 that the SIR2 and resveratrol link was nothing more than a lab error in yeast. So the pressure is now back on Sinclair. He needs to find a way to show that resveratrol does indeed activate a 2 in one without needing the fluorescent dye. Which brings us onto a 2013 paper using human cells. So not yeast cells like the original experiments. David Sinclair knew that that was a dead end. He needed to do something different. 
Sinclair needed to find a naturally occurring peptide that can act similarly to the fluorescent dye in helping the resveratrol to activate the sirtuin-1 enzyme, and luckily enough they found one. Certain peptides containing tryptophan, when they're mixed with resveratrol, can allow the activation of the sirtuin-1 enzyme. So you can make resveratrol activate the sirtuin-1 enzyme, but in a very controlled environment that doesn't represent what actually happens in the human body. So in a last gasp effort, Sinclair managed to protect his plausible deniability. And to tie off this section, in 2020 a trial used CRISPR technology to conclusively show that resveratrol doesn't directly activate sirtuin-1. Instead, it stresses the cells, but by this point it's too late. Sinclair has his second wall of incompetence protecting him. The third and final layer was regarding the mice and resveratrol research, claiming a lifespan extension effect. In this experiment, one group of mice was fed a highly toxic diet that caused their liver to enlarge to such a degree that it squashed the lungs and caused the mice to suffocate and die. Resveratrol prevented this bizarre type of death and allowed those mice to live just as long as the mice who were fed the normal diet. So not exactly a longevity study, but again it reinforces this idea of plausible deniability. Later in 2013, the interventions testing program trialed resveratrol. They consulted David Sinclair to know what dose to use, and the interventions testing program also confirmed that the resveratrol was being absorbed by the mice. But unfortunately, during this series of experiments, no lifespan extension effect was seen. Here's the head of the interventions testing program, Dr. Richard Miller, discussing this resveratrol saga. Less than 20 years ago, basically, David's lab at Harvard published work showing that when resveratrol was given to metabolically ill mice that were being basically overfed, it produced a longevity benefit. So the mice in question were being given a diet consisting of 60% coconut oil. They were being poisoned. The mice that were dying because they were on 60% coconut oil were dying because their livers got so big, so filled with fat, that it compresses the chest cavity and crushes the lungs and the mice cannot breathe. So understand, they're not really studying aging. So the second part of your question was, how did this influence our decision to test resveratrol? And the answer, this is behind the scenes gossip, but it's completely true, is that we were ordered to test it. Richard Hodas, the director of the National Institute on Aging, was very impressed with resveratrol and like you, he was getting, I'm sure, hundreds or thousands <laughs> of questions uh, a year, requests like, why don't you guys test resveratrol? So resveratrol did not go through our usual screening process. This was a directive from the top. This was a, the only time this has happened. We were instructed, you will be testing resveratrol. And I called David Sinclair and said, what dose should we use? The same dose that you used in your paper? And he said, no, 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 that's much too low. Use at least five times, 10 times, 20 times higher. So we followed David's advice. We were told to do start some of the mice in youth and others of the mice in middle age, and we did that and had no effect on longevity. And here is Sinclair lying about this saga on Dr. Peter Atia's podcast. What did those studies find, the, the ITPs? Uh, they just showed what we already published, which is that if you give resveratrol in regular food, it doesn't extend lifespan. And why did they, why couldn't that have been overcome? I mean, that seems like they should have given that you'd already, because you published yours in 06. These were like 08 and 11 or 11, 12, something like these were several years later. Sure. Well, the, the, yeah, those scientists didn't consult me at all. Um, they just put in the food and went for it. I see. David Sinclair's name is on that 2013 paper published by the Interventions Testing Program. Clearly, he was consulted. But anyway, the interventions testing program results came after that 2008 deal, so GSK couldn't use that to get their money back. Overall, from GSK's perspective, they couldn't get their $720 million back from Sinclair because either through luck or genius, he'd shown himself to be incompetent. And you can't prove that someone is defrauding you if you're incompetent. Genius. And he's using this exact playbook for another molecule, which I'll talk about shortly. But for now, let's finish this resveratrol debacle, so that if you are considering whether or not to take resveratrol supplements, you have more information to make your decision. GSK threw everything they could think of to try and make the sirtuin and resveratrol theories work. Since they were using micronized resveratrol, like the supplement companies today sell, absorption wasn't the issue. 
They tested micronized resveratrol in multiple myeloma patients, but unfortunately that trial was terminated early due to severe side effects including toxicity to the kidneys. And the micronized resveratrol research was discontinued. Instead, GSK designed specific molecules that do activate the sirtuin one enzyme. But in the clinical trials, those sirtuin-1 activators had no effects. So in 2013, GSK decided to shut the door on Searchers Pharmaceuticals and closed everything down. And to this day, you'll hear Sinclair on podcasts explaining all of this away by repeating that resveratrol isn't well absorbed, and that's why none of the experiments worked. If I take resveratrol, uh, I do it with a, something that's fatty. Food, fatty. Please, so yeah. some oil, a yogurt, it works really well. But like I've mentioned multiple times in this video, absorption isn't the issue because the resveratrol is micronized. The issue is Sinclair's incompetence slash genius. Other groups tested high doses of micronized resveratrol in humans, but no benefits were seen and instead it seemed to cause harm. Other groups tested low doses of resveratrol with the idea that since resveratrol stresses and poisons the body, maybe a small amount of the stress would encourage the body to adapt and become more efficient. This effect is known as hormesis. But at the time of recording this video, there's no clear reproducible benefits of using small doses of poison. Instead, in a meta-analysis of the human studies for micronized resveratrol done by the meticulous Cochrane organization, there are no benefits seen. But not only are there no benefits from micronized resveratrol, there's likely harm. We've got multiple studies showing that micronized resveratrol blunts the positive effects of exercise and it lowers testosterone levels. As such, the clinical guidelines actively recommend against using resveratrol supplements. All of this hasn't stopped David Sinclair from wanting to cash in further. He's created a company called TallyHealth, who sell a supplement with resveratrol mixed in. Wild. And he's doing this entire playbook again with a different molecule called NMN. He hyped NMN up on the Joe Rogan podcast and lots of people started taking it. He then created a company called Metro Biotech with a proprietary blend of NMN, just like he did with resveratrol, and then lobbied the FDA to ban regular NMN supplements with the intention to create a monopoly of the market. Exactly the same playbook for what he did with resveratrol. I've made this video now because some recent developments have happened. David Sinclair recently hyped a study of his claiming that his proprietary supplement reversed aging in dogs. This led to Professor Matt Caberline and the former Dean of Harvard Medical School, Professor Jeffrey Flyer, to make public statements against David Sinclair. Matt Caberline states that after careful consideration, I've renounced my membership in the Academy for Health and Lifespan Research, for which David Sinclair is the president. I find it deeply distressing that we've gotten to a point where dishonesty in science is normalized to such an extent that Nobody is shocked when a tenured Harvard professor falsely proclaims in a press statement that the product he is selling to pet owners has reversed aging in dogs. To me, this is textbook definition of snake oil salesman. He goes on to say, I have renounced my membership in the Academy due to ongoing behavior by Academy President Dr. David Sinclair that I find both personally and professionally unacceptable. While I can't control how others will behave, I choose to not associate with individuals or organizations that do not align with my core values. The former Dean of Harvard Medical School, Professor Jeffrey Flyer, agrees. He says, indeed, quite sadly, there are some snake oil salesmen in the Harvard Med faculty. In the anti-aging field, the key actor is seemingly impervious and indifferent to rational critique. Absolutely wild, and it's important you know the story so that you've got more information when you're making your own health choices. So instead of following snake oil salesmen, make sure to check out this next video here where I go through all of the latest clinical guidelines on how to prevent heart disease.